Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Morozov, and I'm uh, uh, Secretary General of the World Psychiatric Association. First of all, I would like to welcome all participants uh, um, on behalf of uh, President of the World Psychiatric Association, uh, Dr. Abzal Javed, and to introduce uh, you one of the Mm, uh, coming WPA webinar series, which today will be devoted to the problem of recent advances in the treatment of bipolar disorders. This is a really extremely interesting and update, uh, you know, um, topic information about uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, enigmatic in some way uh, disorder. And uh, I think today, uh, two distinguished professors, Professor Mauricio Tohen and Professor Alan Young, will speak about uh, this subject. I would like also to underline that WP is very grateful to Aristoteles University in Greece and um, to Professor Kostas Pontulakis, who is the uh, organizer of these uh, webinars and who uh, introduced uh, uh, international audience to such distinguished lecture and uh, thank you very much Kostas you make a tremendous work and uh, I have a lot of feedback from different parts of the world for your fantastic you know uh, uh, organizational and uh, scientific contribution to organization of this uh, series and we start our our seminar with the um, presentation of Professor Mauricio Tohen with the topic and management of acute mania. Professor Mauricio Tohen is the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and University Science and University Distinguished Professor and the University of New Mexico Health Science Center in Albuquerque, USA. His area of expertise include treatment and outcome of bipolar disorders and the first episode psychosis. Professor Toen uh, has authored over 350 original publications, has over 35,000 scientific citations. In uh, 2014, Dr. Toen was recognized in Thomson Reuters, the world's most influential scientific minds, 2014. Honoris were the scientists who rank in the top 1% by citation of their published work in 21 broad field between 2002 and 2012. Dr. Toyn is one of the 100 scientists worldwide recognized in psychiatry psychology category. Uh, in 2016, the International Society for Bipolar Disorders awarded uh, him the Morgan Skew Award for Education and teaching. Um, Dr. Maurizio Tohen was uh, selected as a 2016 NAMI exemplary psychiatrist. In 2017, Dr. Tohen was recognized at Expert Cape as top 0.12% uh, expertise in bipolar disorder worldwide based in published article from 2007, 2017, and 2010, 2020. Well, I'm sorry to be so long. Uh, uh, Professor Toyn, floors is yours, please. Thank you very much, Professor Morosov. It is an honor to be introduced by you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Costas, uh, I agree with Professor uh, Morozov and the statement from others worldwide of the great job you do. Uh, th uh, thanks for facilitating this conference. And most of all, thank you to our audience. Our, our global audience gives me, a, it's for me an honor to be able to, to share uh, um, some of the findings in the treatment of acute mania with all of you. So uh, let me get my slides ready. Okay, so as you can see, folks, uh, on the slide, as Professor Morisov mentioned, I am now the, the, I've been for the last nine years the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of New Mexico. Um, but I've, I've been working in bipolar disorder all my professional life as a researcher and certainly uh, as, a, as a clinician. 
First, let me just tell you something uh, uh, very uh, uh, briefly about uh, about New Mexico. Uh, it is uh, number one. It is not. Uh, it's not new, <laughs> and it is not part of Mexico. As you can see, New Mexico is a what we call a southwest state. Uh, it is east of Arizona and west of Texas, and then in the south we have Mexico, and in the north we have uh, Colorado. So that's where we are right now. It's for us, it's uh, 11 o'clock, and uh, for, for, for you, of course, it's a different, uh, 11 o'clock in the morning for, for all of you is obviously a different time. Just my uh, disclosures, uh, I, I did work for industry for a period of time, designing studies. I was an industry scientist, and uh, uh, currently I advise mostly in the design of uh, clinical trials. I'm a psychiatrist and, a, and a epidemiologist by training, and as I mentioned, my interests are bipolar and first episode psychosis, but certainly uh, uh, research design as well. So um, let's uh, talk about uh, treatment of mania. And of course, w what always has uh, interested me about uh, mania is that it can uh, you, you have a different challenges. You have, of course, the depressive phase and the manic phase, and the treatments are different. Uh, there, might, there might be some similarities in terms of, uh, of maintenance treatment, and, and, and Professor Young will tell us more about that. But uh, that, what, that's what is interesting about bipolar disorder, so the different challenges. The other thing is the, the, the amount of comorbidity uh, attached to bipolar disorder, medical comorbidity, substance abuse comorbidities, uh, is extremely high, and that has a number of consequences in terms of the management of the patient, including the, the pharmacological uh, 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 treatments with drug-drug interactions. So very, very, uh, very challenging uh, to treat. Uh, as, is, as in any psychiatric condition, therapeutic alliance is key, education is key, working with the family is key, uh, and then, uh, of course, bipolar, during, especially during the manic with mixed features, it is the most lethal psychiatric condition, the most lethal. Because you have that combination of hopelessness as, as impulsivity, which is lethal. So we, we, as our colleagues in oncology and other conditions, have to make uh, life-death decisions. Like when we uh, see a patient's a patient in the emergency service, that's why I'm dressed like this today with my white coat because I'll, uh, I'll be covering the emergency service. We, some of those decisions we make about what to do with a patient who's in crisis can, can lead to trouble if we make the, the wrong decision. Uh, it's, of course, uh, <clears throat> bipolar disorder as, as, as other psychiatric conditions is a medical condition. Uh, so we need uh, a medical workup. We need to rule out a, uh, a, a medical condition that is causing the, uh, the, the, the symptoms of, of, of mania, including hyperthyroidism and so on. Then with the, need for the, with the medications, we need to make sure that we don't hurt. As, as uh, the, the saying in Latin goes, primo non nocere. It's just let's let's first let's not make any let's not cause any harm. I'm going to be focusing today on the pharmacological treatment. I already mentioned that psychoeducation and building trust with patients is essential for the ph pharmacological management. One of the reasons is because patients uh, with bipolar disorder, especially in the manic phase, are uh, non-adherence. It's actually more common than adherence. So you have to deal with treatment discontinuation or not taking the, the treatments at the right time. Uh, so partial non-adherence is, is actually quite, quite common. And that pharmacological treatment goes back to 1949 with K, when Cade actually published in the Medical Journal of, of Australia the treatment of mania. So pharmacological treatments in mania our, uh, our, our, it's, it's almost, uh, in 30 years, it's going to be uh, 100 years old. So we go way back. Um, now, current treatments, of course, include the, uh, the antipsychotics. Here you have a list of, of the antipsychotics that we use 
in in not only in acute mania but also in bipolar depression uh, and something that I would also would uh, like to emphasize and I assume Professor Young will be talking about it is don't forget the uh, intramuscular medication last uh, 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 long lasting and these can be initiated of course when the patient has recovered from the manic episode we have the mood stabilizers and we have of course the benzodiazepines so uh, this is the common treatment uh, it used to be lithium uh, the main treatment for acute mania that was the, uh, the 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 first place to go not anymore actually if you see studies comparing the antipsychotics with lithium the so-called mano a mano or head to head the antipsychotics do better in the treatment of acute mania. Furthermore, when a patient is uh, uh, manic, there's also issues with dehydration, with, as we know, lithium has a narrow therapeutic index, so not the ideal drug, and it works slowly, not the ideal drug to use in the treatment of acute mania. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be uh, um, focusing on bipolar depression uh, today, but I can tell you that even in bipolar depression, uh, certainly antidepressants is not the correct treatment antidepressant monotherapy but can it be used with antipsychotics absolutely especially with the specifically with the atypical antipsychotics and in antidepressants antidepressants are not contraindicated if they are accompanied by an antipsychotic or a mood state stabilizer and this is specifically in bipolar depression so getting back to uh, acute mania, and, and let's, let's still talk about uh, lithium. Uh, keep in mind that the peak levels are within uh, two to three hours, and the total absorption is going to take eight hours, uh, and you reach the steady state not until five to seven days. So this is exactly the reason why lithium is not the ideal treatment for acute mania. It can be used. And certainly, it can be used, and it's very helpful in combination with antipsychotics. In fact, uh, there's the large number of studies show that an atypical and lithium are better than either of themselves alone. So that marriage is, an, or or with valproate, is the most effective treatment in acute mania. And then, as I mentioned before, before you have interactions with uh, other medications that our patients frequently have medical conditions uh, and diuretics for instance for the hypertension and then you get into the toxic levels with with lithium when they're acutely ill um, we need to keep an eye on uh, long-term uh, long-term uh, uh, problems and again this is going to be discussed by by professor young um, careful with the uh, neurotoxicity narrow therapeutic index it actually could be a matter of getting dehydrated. Like when you're in places like in New Mexico where it's the desert, uh, people get dehydrated and just uh, increasing the blood, blood levels light, uh, lightly can, can, can lead to, uh, the, to a toxic state. Um, this is actually a, a, a key study that um, it was led by uh, uh, Dr. Supis I'm sure many of you know Dr. Supis, and this is a paper that she was the lead author with uh, myself and Professor Valdesarini at McLean a number of years ago. Uh, and I must confess, this is the only paper that I've sent to the Archives of General Psychiatry, now JAMA Psychiatry, and get accepted on submission. Usually you got a revision and this and that. This was accepted right away, and it was really, uh, it was really quite, uh, quite, it made an impact which is uh, when patients stop lithium, you get an acute exacerbation of mania. So beware of that. Be careful. In fact, when I have uh, patients who are not adherent, I stay away from lithium because of this risk. Uh, maybe if you combine it with a, a, a neuroleptic, but again, we'll hear Professor Young talk about the, uh, the acute uh, <clears throat> the, the, the maintenance treatment. So up until uh, the end of the of last uh, century, in the mid 90s, the only treatment for acute mania were uh, lithium, and of course the typical antipsychotics. So this was a a revolutionary uh, paper that was published by Charlie Bowden, 
very dear to me. Uh, uh, sadly, he, he passed away uh, within the last uh, few weeks. So I, Charlie will be uh, remembered certainly by me f in many different ways. And Charlie published this paper, and it was the first treatment, after, again, after the antipsychotics and lithium that was used, the typical antipsychotics for the treatment of acute mania. And as you can see, uh, it was as effective as lithium uh, and definitely more, uh, both more effective than placebo. So this was the, the only other treatment that had been approved by the uh, US Food and Drug Administration for acute mania was actually the first one was chl chlorpromazine. And that was in the early 50s, 1952. Well, first it was, uh, it was actually the first treatment uh, approved by the FDA was chlorpromazine in 1952. Lithium didn't come to this part of the world until the 1970s. Uh, and that's when it was approved. So uh, after that, the next treatment was, that was approved was Valpret. And again, this study conducted by Charlie Bowden. So again, first treatment of chlorpromazine in the 50s, then lithium in the 70s, and then in the 90s, it was uh, Depakote. Um, as all drugs, there's no drug that is free of side effects, unfortunately. There's no, not a single drug that we use in the treatment of bipolar disorder. Uh, these are the major side effects, uh, including nausea and vomiting that at higher doses, which is more effective when you give at high doses, uh, but it can cause nausea. It's more effective in terms of acute mania. And then there's a the weight gain and there's loss of hair. Um, and we don't, uh, he here in the U.S., we do not prescribe it in women uh, of childbearing potential. It can actually cause polycystic ovaries. So we, we, we stay away from Depakote um, um, in, in both the acute and the maintenance phase. Um, and and uh, the nice uh, uh, the those are the, the uh, UK uh, guidelines uh, also does not recommend to be used in uh, in young women. This is a very interesting study that was published by by Swan at the beginning of the century, and uh, it, it 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 actually made the difference between lithium and 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 valpret. What uh, what uh, Professor Swan found in in uh, red you have placebo. This is uh, Balpret and this is lithium. So depending on the number of previous episodes, the response to lithium they both separated from from uh, from placebo. This was actually a subset from the Bowden study. So patients who had at least four or five episodes actually had a better response to Valpret as opposed to lithium. And this is actually an interesting approach about uh, the treatment of bipolar disorder, the staging. So do you treat the patients in first episode mania the same in those with multiple episodes? The answer is no, because those with multiple episodes, they tend to be less responsive to lithium and still are responsive to the to the antipsychotics, but they're very sensitive, so you have to be very thoughtful with that. And this is a study, again, uh, published 22 years ago that led to this difference between lithium and valproate in terms of the acute treatment. Gabapentin, uh, it, 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 from the point of view of, effic of tolerance, beautiful, no side effects for, for the treatment of acute mania. The problem is that uh, actually placebo was better than gabapentin. So gabapentin, evidence that is not effective in the treatment of acute mania. Very well tolerated, useful in anxiety, but not useful in the treatment of, a, of a acute mania. Haldol plays a, a special role in the treatment of acute mania. And I can tell you there's been a lot of head-to-heads with the atypicals and haloperidol. Not a single a typical antipsychotic has beaten Haldol, not a single one. And actually, Haldol has beaten some of the atypical antipsychotics. Um, we, uh, we did a, a study uh, when I was working for industry comparing olanzapine against Haldol. And then in the first two weeks, Haldol was doing better. Then eventually, olanzapine caught up. But in terms of uh, how fast it is, nothing like Haldol. 
So, why is in Haldol the choice of treatment? There's a problem with haloperidol, colleagues, is that it can be depressogenic. So, uh, studies have shown that when you treat uh, acute mania with Haldol, that can actually make patients switch to depression. Same as the monotherapy of antidepressants can make patients switch into mania. In this case, Haldol can make them switch into depression. So, that's why it's not the... Uh, the, 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 the medication to go for that reason, but very effective. Um, here in, uh, in the U.S. and New Mexico, uh, it is one of the most widely used treatment intramuscular. Uh, it works fast. Uh, it, of course, it got cuts EPS, but we combine it with um, the anticholinergics, uh, uh, and, uh, and, but very effective in the treatment of acute mania. So as you can see, a number of studies that have shown uh, good, good efficacy. Um, now, uh, this is actually an, an interesting study. Getting back, again, this goes back to the 70s. Uh, I mentioned already that lithium was approved in the U.S. in 1972. Well, this is a study done by Bob Fryan, used to be the leader in bipolar uh, at the end of last century. And this actually showed how chlorpromazine was better than lithium. So you see, uh, out of the 62 with who received chlorpromazine, eight did not respond. Of the 56 that received lithium, 29 did not respond. So definitely for acute mania, it, like, and it goes back uh, more than 50 years ago, the antipsychotics were proven to be the best treatment. Of course, chlorpromazine has the risk of hypotension. Also very cheap, which uh, 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 colleagues from other parts of the world, you think that here in the U.S. we have all drugs. Well, in a poor state like New Mexico and for poor folks, uh, we cannot give them the latest treatments. And when we make decisions about treatments, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have to take price into account. Especially European colleagues, you don't have that problem that we have here in the U.S. Um, this is a study that uh, we conducted while I was working in, in industry, olanzapine versus uh, placebo, and uh, it was the first atypical that showed efficacy in acute mania. This was published in the 2000s, as you can see, effective since week one. And of course, uh, olanzapine is effective, but the, the side effect profile, not, not very attractive. We know the metabolic, metabolic syndrome or such. You can even ha have increased triglycerides within the first week of treatment. Uh, so if you're using it, uh, for folks, get triglycerides because if you're getting in the first week, that talks about an insulin sensitivity. Um, this is a, a very interesting uh, 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 meta-analysis that we did with uh, uh, Dr. Cavazzoni. Dr. Cavazzoni actually now works for the FDA. And this is, uh, it addressed an issue that People talked about uh, patients with bipolar disorder being more sensitive to antipsychotics and what's with schizophrenia. And here you have it. We looked at patients who had received haloperidol, and you could see uh, these are patients with, uh, 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 the, with schizophrenia. You have the red, and, and, how, and with um, bipolar, you have the green. So Haldol, there was more EPS in patients with bipolar, uh, and, but, and, and it was especially important uh, uh, in, uh, in the, the key thing is that this study did show that, uh, or analysis, that bipolar patients are both uh, are sensitive more than schizophrenics, both with, uh, especially with Haldol, but not as much with uh, one of the atypicals. Quetiapine. Uh, Quetiapine is probably one of the best mood stabilizers, uh, and it, uh, it's uh, the problem. Quetiapine has a number of issues. It has efficacy. Uh, it's it's good in bipolar depression, in maintenance. You can't use it in maintenance because of the metabolic issues. Not as bad as olanzapine, but uh, in getting up there. Also, it's hard to titrate. You have to go slowly, so not ideal to treat acute mania. You have to go to doses up to 800 to 1200, but it has efficacy. Risperidone, Risperidone is, uh, is, this is uh, the studies that, uh, as you can see, you had an improvement during the first week, better than placebo. 
um, better tolerability than quetiapine and olanzapine, but of course we have we still have the EPS and we still have some weight gain. Not as bad, but but it's still you can still have it. A repriprazole. Um, a repriprazole. Uh, it has a, uh, 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 the, the studies are quite interesting. Again, separating in the first uh, week. Uh, uh, and this is against placebo, also approved by the FDA. The uh, profile actually quite uh, re uh, quite good compared to the th the three that I already mentioned. A lot, even e even uh, well, lithium it has other issues, but uh, risperidone, quetiapine, and olanzapine. Uh, risperidone, I mean, aripiprazole looks better from the tolerability part. The problem with um, uh, aripiprazole is not as effective in treating uh, bipolar depression. Actually, the studies were not positive. Effective in treating uh, as adjunctive in major depression, and then in maintenance, it doesn't protect from depressions. But for acute mania, uh, and even in first episodes of mania, it's, it's probably one of the, the ones that I certainly consider. Luracidone, interesting drug, uh, well tolerated, uh, approved by the FDA to treat bipolar depression, uh, but not approved for mania. Uh, there are some studies that uh, there's a study in Japan that show that it did improve, but in the U.S. we don't have the indication, and and, and, and for that matter, uh, neither does the EU. There's no indication for mania in the U.S. just for bipolar depression. Now, this is a combination. So here you have it. This is uh, um, actually, uh, although this is green, it's not here. This is actually risperidone. This is for olanzapine. It's adjunctive. Uh, this is this is uh, the a typical in this case uh, risperidone and lithium compared to lithium alone. In all studies, this is olanzapine. Um, this is quetiapine. Um, and, uh, and 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 this is uh, that that's also with thiopine. So more effective, the combination of lithium and, and atypical, uh, quite effective, more effective than the atypical alone. Uh, some guidelines. Guidelines are helpful, especially when you teach. Uh, nice and the British, uh, 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 which of course comes from the UK. Uh, it, it, it what it shows is. Uh, if the patient is uh, not on, the, on, the, on, a, on an antibiotic treatment, is uh, make sure that the patient is not on an antidepressant because it, it does it can exacerbate mania. So there's different options that you can offer. We've been mentioning that, but the nice actually does. Uh, um, of course, efficacy is important, but so is tolerability. Uh, and then if the antipsychotic alone is not, the NICE indicates add lithium, as we've been mentioning. Um, these are the treatments not recommended. Um, now, if the patient is in an anti on, a, on an antimanic uh, agent, but not in an antidepressant, if on lithium, make sure you check the levels. But again, I don't, for acute mania, not ideal. And on Valpid, of course, levels uh, uh, that you can get. But you can add, if they're already on the medication, uh, one of the things that sometimes people do, patient gets, uh, uh, say it's on lithium and gets acutely manic. Don't discontinue the lithium abruptly. Don't, because as I mentioned, that <laughs> then the patient is going to get even worse. Now for the British uh, uh, Association of Psychopharmacology, the guidelines, Again, uh, uh, similar. Uh, the first line of treatment is an antipsychotic, and second line you can add lithium or valproate. Treatment resistant. Consider clozapine, ECT. Actually, clozapine. This is very interesting. When I was at McLean, uh, we did a, a, a study that actually patients who had bipolar disorder responded better to clozapine than those with schizophrenia. Of course, clozapine for schizophrenia is a great treatment, but it did even better in those with bipolar disorder. Uh, lots of problems with side effects, even more than olanzapine uh, and quetiapine with uh, weight gain. But uh, for those who don't respond to regular treatment, consider ECT, 
Another great mood stabilizer, it treats acute mania, it treats acute, uh, acute bipolar depression. It's also useful for maintenance. Uh, and this is uh, the, the BAP, British Association of Psychopharmacology. If not on long term, I can discontinue the antidepressants and, and then consider an antipsychotic. And, and what is the best treatment? It depends on your patient. Uh, that, that, that is the correct answer. It varies from patient to patient. Um, the, for, make sure, again, that you don't go above the, the point 0.8. Uh, you, you get into the narrow therapeutic index, point 0.8, point 1.0 might, 1 might do better. But again, you're getting close to the toxic features. Mixed features, we used to call it mixed episodes. I, I do like that about the uh, DSM-5 and now the, the revision. The mixed features, you can have mixed features in, dep in major depression uh, and treatments are different. The, the one interesting, uh, uh, um, actually in terms of the guidelines, both NINES and BAP, they, uh, they, pro they suggest treating as manic episodes and certainly avoid the antidepressants. Um, there's not a lot of studies on it. Interesting is the loracidone study. And actually, this is for MDD with mixed features. As you can see, it had a good, uh, it had a good uh, response. A little bit about res resistant mania. We mentioned ECT, recommended by NICE. Uh, close up in a number of studies. A number of years ago, we, we did a study in, in treatment-resistant uh, mania with uh, Bob Green, also good results, and you have some studies coming out of, of Europe. Uh, let me just uh, actually end this uh, talk with emphasizing non-pharmacological treatments. Certainly, pharmacology is, 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 key, is the foundation for acute mania, but if you add psychotherapy, even better education. You have different psychotherapies. Make sure you do uh, promote regular sleep, uh, avoid drug use. So uh, to conclude, uh, second generation is what recommended by the CINP guidelines. So those are the ones that I actually respect the most. Uh, and then other guidelines like CANMAT, uh, NICE, uh, BAP, also good, good guidelines. Uh, they all recommend the uh, the antipsychotics, but CINP to me it's the most comprehensive. You can use also lithium or valproate, and then when it comes to mania, again uh, resistant, think of clozapine and ECT. This is a picture of my hometown, folks. This is the Balloon Fiesta, uh, and there you got the Rio Grande that it comes from the the Rockies, passes New Mexico and goes on to Mexico, folks. Thank you much for your attention. I hope this uh, presentation was helpful. Uh, well, thank you very much for your very interesting and uh, comprehensive and update uh, uh, paper about uh, treatment of acute pneumonia. And of course, we have some question from the first of all, from the audience. One, we start with, uh, have, you, uh, have you any advice about rapid mood cycling which does not reach mania or hypomania? Uh, very, very good question, <laughs> colleague. The problem with good questions many times is that there's not a precise answer because if there was a precise answer, the, the, the question not, won't be needed. And this is just a perfect example. What is the best treatment for rapid cyclers? Let's, let's say that we're, we're in the, the manic phase or well, in, sometimes you have ultra rapid cyclers that change within hours. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, it, there's no uh, approved treatment for acute uh, uh, rapid cyclers by any regulatory agency in the, in the world. Uh, Professor Morozov, Professor Kostat, Professor Young, correct me if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, there isn't. Uh, I would actually uh, uh, go for, uh, uh, this is what I would do. Um, I would go for treatments of mania uh, and actually would take into, in, into consideration not to give treatments that worsen mania. So uh, a typical, I think, would be, would be uh, reasonable. Haldo, ah, for the reasons I've mentioned, probably not ideal. ECT, 
Uh, actually, I think it's an, an issue, a, a, a good option. And, and let's not forget TMS. I forgot to talk about TMS today, but, but that would be a, a good option. I think Professor Young might have the answer for us. Professor Young. Uh, no, sorry, I just wanted to agree with you, but to say there's a couple of things we always point out, Maurizio, with rapid cycling. Um, one is to discontinue antidepressants, and, you know, that's the usual thing. Um, and sec uh, well, the first point before that is to say that subthreshold rapid cycling, in my mind, you should just treat it like rapid cycling. So, uh, first of all, stop, stop antidepressants, um, then check the thyroid axis. Um, treat the predominant pull, whether it's mania or depression, but Maurizio is absolutely right. You don't want to exacerbate the depression with uh, things like haloperidol. And thirdly, there are a few things that have some small scale evidence for being helpful, such as um, high dose uh, thyroid and also some of the calcium channel antagonists like nimodipine. Uh, but it's an area which needs much more research, as Professor Toen said. And just adding to the thyroid, the optimizing, uh, and if usually uh, if the TSH is, uh, as, as long as it's not higher than, than, than five, then the, the endocrinologists are, are happy about it. But we really need to, uh, to optimize. We, we don't want it at four or five. We really want it uh, low. That's really optimizing the level of the, of the TSH. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, for adding to that, that question. Well, uh, thank you. And uh, um, we are coming to the next uh, uh, question. It's uh, particularly interesting for us, uh, important for us that uh, the next question come from Bhutan. Uh, the, this country uh, start to express their interest to join the WPA rank. And for us, it's uh, very symptomatic that the psychiatrists from Bhutan uh, actively participate in our work. So the question, what is the maximum dose of haloperidol injection in one day? We don't have oral formulation. So for agitated manic patient, how many times and how frequently can we administer haloperidol in a day? Thank you. And I, I think we should add uh, what is the dose. Yeah. Thank you, uh, colleague from Bhutan. Very interesting place. Never had the fortune of visiting Bhutan, but thank you for the question. And uh, you, your question reminds me of uh, what we used to call rapid neuroleptization uh, that we don't use in the 21st century, but we used to use it at the end of the 20th century, which was with uh, using haloperidol, five milligrams every hour IM. Uh, it actually caused trouble. And in fact, there were some deaths. Uh, so I, I would be careful. Now, I did mention that in the emergency service here in, uh, in, the, in, in, in New Mexico, we, we do use the IM. And um, I actually uh, would, uh, don't go at doses higher than 20 milligrams in a day. Uh, in fact, there was a study published a number of years ago that showed that uh, for, a, for PO, that doses higher than 10 uh, were never, there was no difference in, in general in doses higher than 10, going up onto 80 milligrams of PO. But once you get to 10, uh, then you reach that. Uh, so when I write my orders in the psych emergency service for IM, uh, the most I would do is uh, uh, haloperidol two milligrams um, um, every, every four hours. So as you can see, if you do, uh, uh, six times two, so 12 milligrams. I actually don't mo go more than that. I start, the patient is not responding. I try something else. Uh, so I would, I, I don't go more than, than 10, 12 milligrams in a day. I do some more cowboy doctors do. I, I suppose, I suppose they, they do, but uh, rapid neuroptization. And then if the patient is not responding, try something else called promising, quite, uh, quite sedating. Uh, I don't use a lot of olanzapine IM either because when you combine it with benzodiazepines, it can cause uh, major res uh, respiratory problems. 
So again, a dear colleague from Bhutan, I, w I don't go over 10, 12 in one day of I am haloperidol. Thank you for the question. Okay, and the next question, Dr. Salas ask uh, Dr. Toen, in your experience. Uh, may, I, may I interrupt you, Peter? Uh, because uh, Maurizio, we need to clarify here. Uh, a lot of people use higher doses of uh, haloperidol. Okay. Uh, we need to, to say that uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, aggressive titration does not really produce uh, a result. Uh, now, after two weeks, the patient could be better anyway. The question is whether adding more really causes a response or it is just the time that passes. This is what I wanted to, uh, to add because uh, most people don't use 10 to 15 milligrams of uh, uh, IM uh, haloperidol. Uh, I, I apologize for interrupting you, Peter. Uh, no, I, I just wanted to bridge the everyday clinical practice with what Mauricio says, which, for, uh, with which I completely agree, but we need to clarify why things are done this way in practice. Yeah, yeah. Once you go to uh, time, time, time cures many things, including patients getting better, including mania. So if you keep going, you're not only not helping, you actually can can worsen the patient. So I, I, I primo non nocere, which we always should remember that. Thank you for your uh, your addition, uh, Costas. Okay, my next question, um, Doctor Toen, in your experience, what is the best way? to achieve a good therapeutic alliance with patients. Any tips? Thanks. Uh, yes. Um, so here in the US, there's a, there's a approach called collaborative specialty care that was in, started by Kane in first episode psychosis. And of course, that's where the illness start. So that's my key point. That therapeutic alliance needs to start very early on, and it should be collaborative care. Uh, I, I, uh, one of the things that uh, in, in, uh, we, we see in some countries, the doctor is highly respected and so on, and what the doctor says is what matters. I think, at le uh, and, I, and I'm sure this applies uh, worldwide, when you get the patient involved in decision making, that, that's when things go, go well. The other thing that I try to do is get the family involved. Actually, when I see patients, I tell them, if you want me to provide the best possible care that I can provide you, you need to give me permission to talk to your parents, if the person, the patient is young, or your significant other, spouse, uh, uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. I need to be able to talk to them because in, in mania, we have a, in bipolar, we have a term, ter, a term called Anosognosia, apologies, Costas, if I'm mispronouncing that, but it really means that the patient is not aware that he or she is ill. So that's why you need to get the family involved, but well, collaboratively, psychoeducate patients. Are, well, I've met many patients who are smarter than me, uh, and uh, trust them. Actually, another thing that I've seen in the U.S. is direct to consumer marketing. You know, in the U.S., we got a lot of marketing. And now they hear in TV, well, take this drug or that drug. That's not bad uh, because then the patient is educated on the internet. Patients sometimes know more than doctors because they're reading the internet because in, in terms of the illness. So I will summarize, start early, get the patient involved, make it collaborative. When appropriate, get the family involved or significant others. I hope this is helpful, Colleen. Okay, thank you. Next question from Dr. Pallavi Priyam. Is lithium combined with valproate a better combination than lithium with an atypical? Uh, both in terms of the literature and, uh, and practice, uh, not, um, I don't like to talk specifically about my practice, but practice of other folks that I talk to, uh, the combination of either lithium or valproate with antipsychotic is better than the combination of two anticonvulsants. And I'm gonna focus on acute mania. Uh, valproate, unless you do this uh, uh, high dosing of valproate that uh, was done in Cincinnati, but also causing problems, is not ideal for acute treatment. It doesn't work very fast. So for acute mania, I'm with, with NICE and VAP and CINP. 
it is the atypical antipsychotics and then combined lithium or valproid. But lithium or valproid alone, I, I would, it's not contraindicated, but uh, I would say the with the antipsychotic and one or the other would be best. Thank you. Uh, next question from Dr. Arnab Datta. Sir, what is the recommendation on continuing use of antidepressants under cover of mood stabilizer for maintenance of bipolar disorders with predominant depressive episodes. Any prevalence for HGA uh, over lithium valproate in such cases? Thank you. Yeah, there was actually a very interesting uh, uh, study by Lori Altshuler, who's no longer with us many years ago. And uh, she, uh, this was an open label study and she found something quite interesting that when patients, uh, if, if you stop the antidepressant long term, patients who have predominant depressants actually do worse if it's stopped and it is continued, okay? So there is a place, there's definitely a place for the antidepressants, not monotherapy, certainly not monotherapy, but sometimes this continuation of the antidepressant, especially long term, can increase the risk of depression. The other thing is that um, let's we, we sometimes uh, we, we we like to think that in in bipolar disorder we think longitudinally we we don't always do that even when you look at relapse it's relapse in this period like in three months or in a year it's longitudinally I mean day by day so when you have subsyndromal symptoms uh, patients can fun cannot function especially of the depressive type. So I would say antidepressants, as everything we do in medicine, be very thoughtful, think of your patient, but there is a place even for the antidepressants, but again, not monotherapy, combination with others, to prevent relapses and to prevent those subsyndromal depressive symptoms. Thank you for the question. Thank you. And um, next question from Sergei Potanin. What do you think about combination of different mood stabilizers in case of poor response? Uh, well, it's like <laughs> the, the more the better, not necessarily, but definitely uh, many studies have shown and guidelines that combination treatments are more effective than monotherapies. Uh, you, you also want to uh, make sure that you're not giving a medications that, that uh, uh, acts in the same way. You want to give some combination. And this is a problem in psychiatry. We're not like oncology that we do personalized medicine, that we can look at uh, biomarkers. Here is all trial and error. Uh, but, but definitely combination treatments, more efficacy, but more side effects. Sometimes we even forget, we, we've learned now, nowadays to re read EKGs again, because many of our drugs in, in, uh, in, uh, enlarge QTC, and we can have a, a very bad outcome. So, so be judicious, but uh, uh, more than one treatment tend to work better than monotherapies. Thank you. Um, next question from Dr. Satapati uh, from India. How long should we continue mood stabilizers in rapid cyclic bipolar disorder? Uh, well, uh, good, good question again. And, and let me go back to what, what do I, uh, how, how do I answer a frequent question from my patients? Doc, when will I stop my treatment? My honest answer, not until we find a cure. <laughs> So, so for a rapid cycler, uh, uh, I, I, again, when we find the right treatment, uh, I, I, the problem with, uh, with long uh, maintenance treatment, and, and uh, again, Professor Young is gonna talk about it, is that uh, how long is long enough? One year, two years, three years, four years, the rest of your life? Um, and I always go by epidemiology. So the risk of worsening after you stop a treatment or after an acute episode, uh, it actually tends to plateau within a year. If you look at uh, observational studies, that the, after an episode, the patients are relapsing early on, and then after a year, they, they stabilize. So I would say my general uh, uh, answer to this question is, if something works, but you're having side effects, like unfortunately we, we always do, 
I would keep the patient healthy at least for a year. Let's also not forget that each relapse increases the risk of relapse and subsyndromal symptoms, patient's ability to function. I would say a reasonable option would be a, a year. I am not aware of any long-term studies of rapid cyclers with the me medications discontinuation. I don't know if professors Costas or Young are aware of any long-term studies with rapid cyclers. Folks, are you aware of any studies? Not with rapid cycling, but I am going to talk about this in my lecture, so maybe we'll leave it till then. Terrific, terrific. Okay, uh, one particular question from Dr. Haki. Your advice about managing acute pneumonia in a six-month pregnant lady? Uh, yes, that's not an unusual question because uh, uh, half the patients are bipolar. Of the patients who are bipolar are, are females. Most of them are are female and, uh, and and young, and young females get pregnant. So. Uh, and I, I always like to, and, and again, when I'm talking with my patients, if 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 the if the family is planning to start a family, of course the question is: Is medication going to be uh, harmful to me? My answer is: I cannot tell you a hundred percent that it will not. We just don't know. With some drugs, we knew, we do more than others. Uh, actually, the there's more there's the more the more they've been around, the more we know about those drugs. Typical antipsychotics, we know more about in terms of lack of teratogenicity. Lithium and valproate, of course, we know they cause it. Uh, so when to stop? And and um, uh, I would say that if we're going to stop it again, do it slowly. Uh, the problem is that early in the course of the pregnancy is when you have the highest risk. Once the, the the pregnancy has advanced, the risk is lower. So that just makes it a very complicated question. I think it's better to plan ahead. But if the make medication is already on, just don't do it. Just don't do it abruptly. Don't say you stop it tomorrow. If you're gonna stop it, do it slowly because mania itself can actually be harmful to the to the fetus. So I would just be careful that way. Those are general comments. Okay, thank you. And I think it is the last question for the audience from Dr. Bikram Chetri. Since I was talking talk about MDD with psychotic symptoms, I want to get this doubt uh, of mine cleared, please. Keeping serotonin syndrome in mind, it is reasonable to combine the how dosage of TCA with CCRI occasionally for patients with depression, anxiety, for instance, Fluoxetine, 20 milligrams with amitriptyline, 12.5 milligrams. I couldn't get convincing literature on it. Thank you again. Thank you for that uh, comment, Professor Morisov. And, and thank you again, Professor Costas, Professor Morisov for having me here. Uh, I definitely enjoyed it. It's, 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 it's great to talk with colleagues from all over the world. Thank you again. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Alan Young with us. He will talk about the long-term treatment of bipolar disorder. Uh, Professor Alan Young is a chair of mood disorders and director of the Center for Affective Disorders in the Department of Psychological Medicine at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London where he's also head of school and vice dean for academic psychiatry. Uh, Professor Young is uh, the National Institute for Health Research, Mental Health Biomedical Research Center cluster and theme lead in the transactional therapeutic uh, cluster. He is a clinical academic lead in the psychological medicine and integrated care clinical academic group in the South London and uh, Maudsley NHS Trust where he's also a consultant psychiatrist and head of the Affective Disorders Service. Professor Young's research interests focus on the cause and treatments for severe psychiatric illnesses, but particularly on mood disorders. He has received research grants from several funding agencies and has over 500 peer-reviewed publications, including several books about psychopharmacology and affective disorders. 
He is a medical past president of the International Society for Affective Disorders, past president of the British Association of Psychopharmacology, and intermediate past chair of the Special Committee for Psychopharmacology of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. He is also a trustee of the Patient and Family Charity Bipolar UK and of the Drug Safety Research Unit International, uh, respect for his work in pharmacovigilance, pharmacoepidemiology, risk management, and training services for over 30 years. Uh, he's a clarity highly cited researcher for 2020. Now, if I may add, uh, Alan, as well as Mauricio, are both uh, dear friends of mine, colleagues. We both work uh, uh, for the CIMP treatment guidelines, and it is always a pleasure and an honor to have both of you here. Alan, the floor is yours. We are waiting to hear your uh, wise comments and uh, advice. Thank you very much, Costas. And I take it you can hear me. And uh, thank you to the WPA and to uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Fernandes for inviting me to speak. And it's a particular pleasure to speak with Professor Tone on the same uh, session. So these are my disclosures. Uh, I'm presuming uh, Alan, you can see my slides. Uh, Alan, mm -hmm. Alan uh, sorry to interrupt you. Please remove a little bit your microphone away from your mouth. It, uh, Is that uh, better? It, yes, it's much better. All right. And you, you can see my disclosures now, can you? Yeah. You can see the second slide? Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. Okay, so thank you very much to all concerned. And there's a huge amount to cover, so I'm going to do my best in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, this is background reading for all concerned. This is the CIMP guidelines on the definition of evidence-based intervention for treatment-resistant bipolar disorder. Um, Professor Funtanakalis really uh, led on this and a series of papers which review the, ex uh, the evidence in a very expert fashion. So I refer you to this. And I'll also, like Professor Tone, be referring to NICE and BAP guidelines. First thing to say is that bipolar disorder has different phases of treatment. This is from Goodwin and Jameson in 2007. The acute treatment phase, which uh, Maurizio Tone has just covered, usually continues until clinical response, ideally symptomatic remission, and this may last between six and 12 weeks. And then there's a continuation phase, ongoing treatment, from the point of clinical response to the point at which spontaneous recovery may be expected in untreated patients. This addresses the tail of vulnerability after remitted symptoms. And the duration depends on the natural course of the illness. Episodes may last between 17, uh, 7 and 13 months if untreated, and also may involve, for example, the management of post-mania depression. And then maintenance is about preventing or attenuating future mood episodes. And maintenance differs from pure prophylaxis as it may uh, address symptomatic periods. Before we go on to pharmacotherapy, I want to deal very briefly with psychological treatments. Uh, and there's a review by Reinars et al. from 2014, which uh, details these. At the very least, uh, there should be support of psychotherapy. Uh, Professor Tone talked about this in terms of the therapeutic alliance, but there may also be other more bespoke uh, interventions, including CBT, IPT, interpersonal social rhythm therapy, psychoeducation, and family interventions. And David Miklovitz from the United States published in JAMA last year a meta-analysis of these, and you can see compared to treatment as usual, there's evidence for a few of these. CBT, psychoeducation, and family and conjoint. But at the very least, every patient should have supportive uh, psychoeducation from a skilled clinician. So what are the goals in maintenance treatment? Well, to prevent new episodes of illness, either full syndromal or subsyndromal, to reduce morbidity and mortality, to prevent suffering, to enhance functioning and quality of life, and to prevent or reduce suicide. And the uh, Danish National Cohort Study that I reference here just shows why this is important. 
This assessed the risk of suicide after first contact with secondary uh, mental health services, median follow-up of 18 years, and the suicide rate in bipolar patients for completed suicide was 8% for men and 5% for women. And uh, the group with the highest risk was men with bipolar disorder and deliberate self-harm. So 18 years is a considerable follow-up, but of course, longer term follow-up studies such as Professor Angst's and the Zug Canton in Zurich show higher rates of completed suicide up to about 15%. So what are the key questions in maintenance treatment? Well, firstly, when should maintenance treatment be considered? How long should it be continued? and what agents should be used. So when should maintenance treatment be considered? Well, bearing in mind what Maurizio was saying about the first year, and you can see this illustrated in the graph here, in that there's a fairly sharp uh, relapse rate for patients in the first year, but there is a significant relapse rate thereafter. So remember, bipolar disorder is highly recurrent whether you consider it as full syndromal uh, relapse or subsyndromal symptoms. And of course, patients with subsyndromal symptoms, either manic or depressed, have a far higher relapse rate than those without subsyndromal symptoms. And Leonardo Tondo from uh, Italy and Harvard uh, just shows this in this uh, paper in neuropharmacology in 2017 the high rates of relapse into depression, hypomania, and so on and so forth. So there's no doubt that very often there's a need for prolonged treatment. What about the guidelines for starting long-term treatment? Well, in the last decade, these have changed, at least the BAP and NICE, where they both agree that you can consider long-term maintenance treatment after a single severe manic episode. For example, diagnosis of bipolar 1 disorder. NICE guidance uh, says something similar. After each episode of mania or bipolar depression, including the first one, discuss with the person, their carers, etc., managing bipolar disorder in the longer term. This is a big change because when I started in psychiatry over 35 years ago, we used to say that you had to have two or three episodes of bipolar disorder before long-term treatment could be considered. That's now no longer considered by these guidelines to be appropriate. How long should maintenance treatment be continued? Now, bear in mind what Maurizio, and I agree with it, was saying about there being a, a large proportion of relapses over the first year. Uh, but of course, the long-term risk is actually significant. This again was shown by Professor Angst, and this was published almost 20 years ago. And he showed with his long-term follow-up studies that the course of mood disorders, when studied over 40 years, had a risk that was long-standing. The relapse risk in bipolar disorder is about twice that of unipolar. There's approximately one episode every two years, no gender difference. And importantly, patients need to be informed that the bipolar illness does not burn out with time. So the patient is not well and therefore doesn't need treatment. They are well because of the treatment. And the implication of this is that once maintenance treatment has been started, it should continue indefinitely unless the risk-benefit ratio of maintenance medication alters. And unfortunately, it often does, for example, lithium with the kidney with uh, long-term use. So discontinuation of treatment is not indicated when there's good clinical control of the illness. Uh, you should consider continuing treatment indefinitely. Uh, observational data shows that patients with residual symptoms versus remitted have a worse prognosis. That's shown by Professor Judd's paper, Professor Judd and McKiskill and colleagues. If there's subsyndromal symptoms, they relapse three times more. They represent a poor prognosis group and discontinuation is particularly not rational. If treatment is stopped, however, ensure there is a management plan to recognize and treat early warning signs of mania and depression. And as Professor Tone said, if discontinuations take place, taper, and preferably as slowly as is practicable and safe. 
Now, there's been a number of meta-analyses and studies recently, some of them done by colleagues on the call. Uh, this is a study by Kishi et al, published in Psychological Medicine last year, which looked at recurrence rates in stable bipolar disorder patients after drug discontinuation versus continuing maintenance. 22 studies, the maintenance group demonstrating lower recurrence rates of any mood episode, including depressive episodes and manic, hypermanic and mixed, as well as reduced all-cause discontinuation at every observational point up to two years. Discontinuation of uh, medications for more than a month significantly increased risk. However, uh, and this is, I think, in line with what Professor Tone was saying, uh, about 47% of patients who discontinued drugs for six months did not experience recurrence. So recurrence is not inevitable, but it's just more likely. What maintenance agents should be considered? Well, it was essentially uh, very much the same as the treatment of acute mania. In bipolar disorder, we use every drug we can, and we use it in every phase of the disorder. So this is the NICE 2014 versus BAP 2016 uh, summaries. Uh, both agree that lithium should be first line. Uh, and I take Maurizio's point about this is not first line for mania, but first line for maintenance. Um, if lithium is ineffective, consider adding valparate, say NICE. However, BAP is a lot more flexible, saying if lithium alone is ineffective, consider combination treatment. If there's a predominant depression, add lamotrigine, quetiapine, or lorazodone. If it's predominantly mania, add valparate or a dopamine D2 antagonist. Uh, and then there's various treatment options which are uh, discussed thereafter. So it's very important to recognize that lithium remains a first line treatment in many guidelines. Now, this is uh, Kishi again. This is mood stabilizers and or antipsychotics for bipolar disorder in the maintenance phase. Uh, this is another systematic review, including 41 randomized control trials, a huge amount of work. All active treatments other than carbamazepine, lamotrigine plus Vaprate, which had no data, or paliperidone outperformed placebo for relapse rates into any phase of the disorder. Aripiprazole and Valprate, lamotrigine, lamotrigine plus Valprate, lithium melanzapine and quetiapine outperformed placebo for relapses into depression. All active treatments other than aripiprazole and valparate, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, lamotrigine and valparate, outperform placebo for relapse into uh, mania. And acenapin, lithium, melanzapine, quetiapine and valparate outperform placebo for all cause discontinuation. So a nice summary of a large amount of data, essentially showing that drugs which are effective in the acute phase for mania tend to prevent mania in maintenance, Drugs which are effective for acute bipolar depression tend to prevent depressive relapses. And there are some drugs that are effective in both poles, but not very many. Uh, so uh, this is essentially the same data. And I'll just go past this. Now, uh, there's also a systematic review and meta-analysis by Nestre Aravich, which I believe Maritza Tone was an author on. Uh, this looked at preventing new episodes of bipolar disorder in adults. And this was also a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. 22 studies, uh, almost 8,000 patients stabilized for one to two weeks, uh, one to 12 weeks, and followed up for 24 to 104 weeks. 104 weeks, of course, being two years. Psychotropic monotherapy, Overall, and this included lithium, mood st stabilizing anticonvulsants, and second generation antipsychotics, was more effective in preventing new bipolar uh, episodes than placebo. And you can see reasonably impressive significance uh, statistically here. There was a significantly lower risk of new bipolar disorder episodes observed with the following individual drugs aripiprazole, asenapin lithium, olanzapine, quetiapine, and long-acting risperidone. And uh, Maurizio mentioned long-acting risperidone, and of course, long-acting risperidone and long-acting 
aripiprazole, depo injections or long-acting injections, call it what you will, both have reasonably good data about preventing relapse into mania in bipolar disorder. The, uh, this review showed that adding aripiprazole, uh, valparate, quetiapine, or lanzapine risperidone to lithium or a mood stabilizing anticonvulsant was more effective compared with lithium or mood stabilizing anticonvulsant monotherapy. Again, speaking to what Maurizio was saying that if you combine medications, you tend to get greater efficacy, but bear in mind, you also get greater uh, amounts of adverse effects and poorer tolerability. So uh, essentially we've been through this, but one of the key limitations pointed out in uh, this review was that uh, the responder enriched design was present in most trials. Now this means that essentially the maintenance phase followed the acute and continuation phases and then to look at people who had responded to the treatment acutely. Uh, this has been criticized by NICE in particular, but I think as a clinician, this makes sense. If someone has responded acutely, you want to know if that's a good drug to continue in the maintenance phase. Uh, and also the authors pointed out high outcome heterogeneity, which I think is an important limitation of the trials. And you can see uh, Nestroyarovich's uh, data here, which was really quite comprehensive and covered all adjunctive treatments, all agents, and then various different uh, monotherapies. So an interesting and important systematic review and meta-analysis, which is well worth uh, reading if you can find the time. So in terms of the principal maintenance agents, uh, five drugs are effective in monotherapy and placebo controlled trials lasting more than a year. Lithium, quetiapine, uh, and I took part in the quetiapine studies, uh, olanzapine, aripiprazole, and lamotrigine. Uh, Valproate semi-sodium in monotherapy, there's no actual support of placebo control data. It has been shown to be equivalent to lanzapine in a 47-week continuation design, but inferior to lithium in a one-year RCT. All of these drugs, except aripiprazole, which was not studied, reduced psychiatric hospital admission in bipolar patients in an observational study using Swedish national medical registers, but lithium was the most effective. So very often in the Scandinavian studies, including the, Swedish, uh, the Finnish studies, as well as the Swedish and Danish studies, lithium comes out as very effective in real clinical practice. And as I said before, most studies assess patients in whom an acute episode responded to the index drug. And this has been criticized by the statisticians in NICE, for example, but as a clinician, I think it's very important to know that if someone has responded in the acute phase, that they should continue uh, to, to receive that in longer term, and they would be likely to receive benefit. Now, just to return to lithium again, because this is a neglected treatment worldwide. Uh, it's the first line maintenance treatment in BAP and NICE. It should be considered for all patients with bipolar disorder willing to take it, certainly bipolar one, but it's more effective in preventing mania than depression. Very importantly, lithium reduces the risk of suicide by 60% versus placebo. Uh, and this is, I think, something that is perhaps under-recognized about the benefits of lithium in terms of reducing suicide. And Cipriani has shown this, Leonardo Tondo has done marvelous work with Ross Balder Serini and flagging this up. You should be aiming for a level of between 0.6 and 0.8 millimoles per liter to minimize the problems with long-term effects on the kidney. Uh, you should check levels three monthly for the first year and then six monthly thereafter. And uh, there should be a six month check of renal and thyroid function, and you should also check calcium for parathyroid function. Uh, but it's very important that psychiatrists continue to retain lithium as part of their therapeutic uh, armory, not only for bipolar disorder, but also for unipolar disorder. Uh, Quetiapine, as Maurizio said, is a very good mood stabilizer. And then 
the question therefore arises, uh, which is better in the longer phase, uh, quetiapin, lithium, uh, and has this been to placebo? Now, there's a very nice study where this was done by Weisler et al. This is the largest long-term study on the efficacy of lithium, even though it's an AstraZeneca study, which was principally aimed at looking at quetiapin. It included bipolar one patients who at entry had depression, mania, or a mixed episode. They were treated with open label quetiapin and they were stabilized uh, for four weeks or more and then randomized to quetiapin between three and 800 milligrams per day, lithium 600 to 1800 or placebo. And lithium was supposed to be in the range between 0.6 and 1.2. They were then followed up double blind for two years. Um, the median quetiapin dose was reasonably high at 5.46 milligrams per day, but the median lithium level was 0 0.63, meaning there was a substantial proportion of people who had a low lithium level. You can see here the design, open label, large number of patients, 2,438 at, at entry, open label period, bipolar one patients, depression, mania are mixed, at least four weeks stability. And then they were randomized to continue on the quetiapin to go to lithium or to go to placebo. And this of course is a design which is enriched for quetiapin responders. And therefore you must bear that in mind when interpreting the data, uh, especially against lithium. The key results compared to placebo, both quetiapin and lithium increased time to relapse of any mood event, depressive relapse and manic relapse. Quetiapin was superior to lithium for any mood relapse and depressive relapse. But to my mind, this is not a fair comparison because it was a sample enriched for quetiapin response. But nevertheless, it's an important randomized control trial. It established the maintenance benefits of both quetiapin and lithium in both poles of the illness. It was the largest and is the largest maintenance study of lithium. And because lithium prevented depression, it overturned the previous view that lithium was ineffective in preventing depressive relapses. Problems with the study? Well, approximately a third of patients had a lithium level below 0.6 millimoles per liter. Uh, but Willem Nolan and colleagues were able to address this by getting hold of the data and doing a split between uh, patients who had lithium levels greater or lesser than 0.6 versus placebo. And this shows that the group who had the uh, recommended lithium levels, the light blue line, uh, had a significantly better outcome than placebo or the group that had the lower level. So this suggests that lithium needs to be 0 0.6 millimoles per liter or more to prevent relapse uh, into mania or depression in bipolar one. Now moving on to lamotrigine, and there was of course a large number of trials done by these. Um, I first came aware of lamotrigine with, uh, when I visited Bob Post at NIMH in the 90s. And uh, this led to big trials, which were pooled by Guy Goodwin uh, in this paper in Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. And this just shows the lamotrigine protection against depressive episodes. It's a pooled analysis of two 18-month trials. The designs of the trials were exactly the same. So you could pool it. You didn't need to do a meta-analysis. And there was a 39% increase in the percentage of patients who remained intervention free for depression 18 months in the lamotrigine group compared to the placebo group. And you can see uh, in the bar charts that that's a 16% difference, 39% uh, difference, and that's a number needed to treat uh, of about six, so quite impressive. And it's become widely known by psychiatrists that lamotrigine treats or prevents depressive relapse. What's perhaps less well known is there was a lesser magnitude but still significant benefit in preventing mania. So you see a 22% increase in the percentage of patients who remain intervention free for mania at 18 months compared to placebo. And this is still a reasonably 
uh, low number needed to treat. So lamotrigine does have an anti-manic effect, and this surprises many people, as well as the prevention effect for bipolar depression. What about second generation antipsychotics? Well, in terms of monotherapy maintenance, three agents have the UK license for maintenance medication. Of course, others uh, are licensed in other countries, but olanzapine, nitroprisone, quetiapine, each are supported by a placebo controlled trial of greater than a year. Olanzapine and aripiprazole prevent manic relapse. Of course, much of the work, I think all of the work on olanzapine was masterminded by Maurizio. And quetiapine prevents relapse into either pole. Uh, and olanzapine and quetiapine are comparable or superior to lithium for any relapse over one year in a single RCT. Now, we've already talked about antidepressants and bipolar depression. There is no RCT evidence that antidepressants are effective in acute treatment of bipolar depression. I did the emboldened study with Sue McElroy, which included lithium, peroxetine, and placebo. Uh, um, sorry, not lithium. Uh, yes, uh, uh, lithium, peroxetine, placebo, and quetiapine. And the peroxetine group was the largest RCT of SSRIs and bipolar disorder, and there was no greater benefit uh, of peroxetine on depressive symptoms in bipolar one and bipolar two depression than placebo. In terms of maintenance, there's a review by Gami, uh, and he concludes that long-term use of antidepressants adds little benefit to mood stabilizer alone. No evidence of increased switching, however, if the antidepressant is prescribed with an anti-manic maintenance treatment, but more switching if the antidepressant is used alone. And this supports the notion of mood stabilizers, lithium, quetiapine, olanzapine, and so on, uh, lamotrigine as the cornerstones of prophylaxis. However, Professor Tone mentioned uh, Laurie Altshuler's work, and I am sympathetic because I think there's a small subgroup of patients who seem to do better with antidepressants, but they must be used with great care and preferably with a mood stabilizer in combination. Long-term combination treatment, uh, you see work by Maurizio, also by Marcus and by Edward Viesa here. Evidence for long-term combinations is limited despite frequency of use. Most data relates to an antipsychotic plus lithium or valparate from uh, registration trials. Patients in whom an acute episode, usually mania, responds to this combination are typically randomized to continue the combination or switch to lithium or valparate plus placebo. And these trials support continuation of an antipsychotic plus lithium revalprate for olanzapine in an 18 month study done by Maurizio, aripiprazole done by Marcus and colleagues, and uh, quetiapine in two two year studies. In addition, there's a six month study which supports long term lorazidone plus lithium and valprate versus lithium and valprate alone in preventing any relapse when an index depressive episode responded to the combination. Uh, there's also a review here. This is again by Kishi. I'll just remind you of this effects of uh, conventional mid stabilizer alone or in combination with a second generation antipsychotic and occurrence rates. Uh, and this looks at patients who are clinically stable with a combination therapy uh, and looks at the longer term outcome. And if we just go to this, uh, eight studies were pooled, and the conclusion uh, second generation antipsychotics plus mood stabilizers are better at preventing recurrence for up to 12 months. Uh, again, 12 months, as Maritza said, for bipolar one compared to placebo plus mood stabilizer. Again, as Professor Toen said, remember that if you add drugs together, you get extra efficacy, but you do also tend to get extra adverse effects. So to summarize, uh, starting and stopping medication, you should consider offering long-term treatment after the first manic episode. This should be discussed with the patient and the relapsing and recurring nature uh, of bipolar disorder should be uh, discussed fully. 
Now, Maurizio talked about the need for a therapeutic relationship, about collaborative care. I totally agree with this. And I think a big psychotherapeutic challenge is uh, getting the person with bipolar disorder and their loved ones to understand that this is a medical condition which is highly likely to relapse. Now, the choice of medication, you should treat on an individual patient basis. There should be a shared decision-making process. You should take account of drug effectiveness in acute episodes. Uh, and again, you should consider the predominant pole, whether it's mania or depression, uh, that one is trying to manage. In terms of stopping long-term medication, you should discuss relapse signatures, which uh, tend, of course, are individual, but there are themes that come up. People have disturbances in sleep, they may have overactivity, some patients become paranoid, and how to access services early when this happens. And treatment should be stopped as gradually as possible, unless there's a pressing medical reason uh, related to uh, overdose or whatever you should try and, or uh, side effects, you should try and stop treatment as gradually as possible. Major clinical challenges include reluctance by patients to start treatment, uh, and poor adherence. And of course, I think poor adherence has been highlighted for lithium, but it's an issue with all uh, of the medications that we, uh, that we use in bipolar disorder. Options for maintenance treatment, important points to be considered. Uh, olanzapine and iropiprazole are good for the prevention of mania. Lamotrigine, as I've shown, is predominantly prevention of depression. But remember, of course, there is an antimanic aspect. And lithium and quetiapin are more at both poles. Most maintenance trials have a design in which acute responders are randomized, these enriched samples. Indirect evidence supports a maintenance effect. Although specialists in bipolar disorder may consider using these drugs in combination uh, very carefully. Now, there's a, that's really for bipolar one. It's a separate argument for bipolar two, where opinion is very much divided, but some people think uh, SSRI monotherapy, for example, is justified. Options for maintenance treatment, evidence to support long-term combination is limited. The adverse effects are greater than with monotherapy, but hopefully efficacy is greater. Situation in which you should consider maintenance treatment, um, maintenance combination treatment, include the acute episode responding to the combination treatment, inadequate response to monotherapy maintenance, and most evidence because of the regulatory trials are for lithium or valprate plus an antipsychotic. You should, of course, monitor for adverse effects during long-term treatment with all drugs, and, uh, you know, lithium uh, in particular requires reasonably close monitoring, but that's true for all drugs. And if response is poor and you have access to a specialist centre, you should consider getting a second opinion about the uh, overall management of the person with bipolar disorder in terms of maintenance treatment. Here's our reference and I'll thank you for your attention. I'll stop sharing and be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Uh, we have uh, two questions. What's the best option for organic brain caused manic disorder? Uh, well, well, that's it. Depends. It depends how the um, how the organ what the organic cause is really. Uh, I mean, the first thing to say is that uh, there's more of an organic component in late onset bipolar disorder. Uh, we showed this because we looked at a large cohort of patients and patients whose first episode ever after the age of 50 was, um, uh, who had their first episode after the age of 50 had much less of a family uh, loading for bipolar disorder, even though we couldn't find any signs of organic disorder per se. So look for or, or organic causes in late onset. Second thing to say is that you should treat the underlying uh, organic cause. It's actually, in my, my experience, really quite common in the elderly who get high-dose steroids, uh, 
corticosteroids and interest of mine, but we see lots of people have their first episode mania in later life in response to high dose prednisone or whatever. And of course, you've always got to rule out a space occupying lesion and so on. So you've got to do a full neurological workup. And uh, another question is, what is relapse signature? Lap signature is a very interesting technique whereby you go through with the patient the early warning signs of a relapse. Now, as I've said, there are certain common themes. Um, we find people have disturbances in sleep. Uh, they may have overactivity. They may have um, increased spending. Um, I had one patient who uh, when he was relapsing, the first sign was he used to argue more with his wife, uh, and some patients get more paranoid. Now, these are going to differ from patient to patient, but you should go through with the patient and their loved ones what they are. And then when these appear, if you medicate immediately, and there is actually a very nice trial of this by Richard Morris from, from when he was in Liverpool, if you medicate very quickly, you significantly reduce the risk of relapsing into mania. It's not been shown for depression. So we practice this quite a lot. Our nurses and occupational therapists go through the relapse signature technique. We do it with the person and their relatives. Uh, and then we give them medication that they can uh, take or increase uh, even before they see us, uh, typically antipsychotics because they're by far the safest drugs. So I think this is an interesting and underused technique. The other fascinating point is that because of the use of digital um, technology that can measure activity, so things like Fitbits, like this thing on my wrist here, this can measure activity and this changes in the early stages of, um, of manic or depressive relapse. And this is very interesting because this means we could have an objective measure of relapse that would allow us to intervene early and reduce the progression to a full-blown episode. Now that's not yet accepted practice, but I can see it happening in the near future. Okay. Um, what can you say about the combination of olanzapine plus fluoxetine in maintenance treatment of bipolar depression? Well, I mean, you've got the world expert um, on this sitting in New Mexico there. What I can say is that the combination of olanzapine and floxetine is both anti-manic and antidepressant uh, and is a very acceptable um, treatment uh, in the long-term treatment of uh, bipolar disorder. To my mind, and I might ask Maurizio to come in, there's no uh, literature about there being an excess uh, switch into mania or destabilization of mood. So I think it's safe from that point of view and it seems to be effective in both poles. But I don't know if you've got a comment over and above that, Maurizio, as you did all the work. Yeah, th thanks, Alan. Uh, well, actually, the olanzapine fluoxetine combination, in fact, was the uh, first treatment worldwide to be approved by any regulatory agency for bipolar depression. Now, after having said that, is it the best treatment? No. Actually, if you look at the efficacy, other drugs in monotherapy, quetiapine is an example, actually does as well, or for that matter, the other the other two, uh, uh, actually there's three new drugs, very interesting, cariprosine, luracidone, lum lumateperone, that do quite nicely. But when, if you compare, say, uh, there's no head-to-head -head studies, but if you're going to do a maintenance study, if you compare, say, cariprosine, lumateperone, or luracidone against olazapine and fluoxetine, well, of course, the tolerability is obviously better for any of those. So uh, there's no data, I agree, Alan. And I think from the point of view of tolerability, not indicated. Uh, is it contraindicated? No, as, as we know in, in psychiatry and bipolar, everything is trial and error. Sometimes patients respond to one medication, not the other. But from the point of view of safety, uh, especially because of, uh, of olanzapine, it's not something that I would, uh, that I would recommend. But not, not, not the more uh, concrete answer, there's no long-term studies in, in the use of that drug. And specifically, when, when I was working on that drug, it didn't seem like the right way to go. Uh, because of the tolerability issue. Thank you for the question, uh, and, and Alan. That, for, for that was an inside story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was an, an inside story. 
from inside. You mean what I just mentioned? No, no, uh, yes, uh, uh, you were the source of this knowledge. So what yeah. you said was that uh, as as deep as it goes. Let me, uh, let me mention something else. Uh, I think it was a mistake to study olanzapine for fluoxetine. What do those two drugs have in common? They're both made by Lilly. But actually, I think it was a mistake because it, it would have been better, even from the, from the business point of view, to, and this is public, otherwise I wouldn't say, to compare it with uh, olanzapine and sertraline and paroxetine. So making it, and also the, 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 the doses, it was 12.5 uh, and uh, olanzapine and the fluoxetine also kind of an unusual drugs, nothing magic about it. Uh, and actually the, uh, the um, clinicians, what was interesting also is that in some parts of the world, it was actually well received, I'm sure that uh, probably, uh, <laughs> Costas doesn't remember, he was too young. But Alan, you must remember the combination of amitriptyline and uh, perfenosine. It was actually the best combination drug, but it was actually at odd doses. It didn't go quite, quite, quite nicely. Um, so it, I think it was historically, it's valuable for in the 21st century. I, I, that, that's not what I would recommend. But the Risperidone plus uh, paroxetine has negative trials. Mm. I think you're right, and actually that was done. But and what the two drugs I believe were were were, far, were produced by Janssen. Uh, actually, I think nowadays there's some very interesting combinations across industry. Uh, that, for instance, one interesting one is that uh, Lundbeck collaborates with Atsuka. Uh, I, I think those things are good. Uh, global collaboration. I'm, I, I think I'm a globalist. Well, I know I'm a globalist. Are always are always are always good. But when you want to stick just to your own, no, not not too good. Just to clarify things for our audience, uh, yeah. a, a problem with combination treatments is that. The first thing is that different companies might own different substances. So when a company goes to test drugs, usually picks drugs that uh, this company owns their patent. Mm -hmm. uh, and second, uh, companies are uh, not willing to uh, to test combination treatments because they have too too too, too many uh, adverse events. So the the chance that uh, negative trials. Uh, uh, come up is is high and doesn't worth uh, the money. And uh, the third is that when they come to combination treatments, uh, already the patents have expired or are all, almost ready to expire. And patent does not, in, in the US it's different, but in the rest of the world, patents do not cover combinations. So uh, for a number of reasons, we don't have enough data for a number of reasons, not because of science, but because of the market, we don't have enough data for combination treatments. And we, we are not going to have in the near future unless things change. Uh, just to, to let the audience know why there is this specific gap in our uh, knowledge. You know, something that actually Alan also mentions, sometimes in the past, sometimes negative trials were not published, they were just hidden in the drawer. Uh, that actually has changed. I, I actually, my opinion of the industry, I, 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 I was there. Uh, it's a good one because if, if, if at, at least in the US, if you do something wrong, it's not that you'll be criticized. You can go to prison. If you make, if, if you make up data, consequences are pretty bad. And I think some of the good things that have happened is a clinical trials, uh, uh, network uh, that was, uh, I think it was initiated by the FDA that every single study, and actually journals have been great in doing that, you're, you're including your journals, Costas, that in order for a study to be uh, published, it, it, it needs to have been registered and so on. Uh, so so, so it's, uh, industry has done good work, but it's great that the, that the governments have kept an eye on them, because otherwise they wouldn't have uh, done many of the things that they have done. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, I think one of the most notable examples of this was 
the topiramate trials being published in one paper, and that was bipolar. So in some ways, bipolar led the field for this because all the trials for Topamax were negative in bipolar. They were published all in one paper, but they were put out there, which was really good. Another great example about that, Alan, and I agree with you. I think that uh, bipolar, bipolarologists, as, as, uh, as, uh, as we used to be called, uh, have done great. Also, the other one is with lamotrigine. The evidence, lamotrigine actually is great in preventing depression, nothing better. Uh, and actually, um, I mentioned Charlie Bowden, a great friend who recently passed away. We did a mode analysis that was looking at data day by day, and lamotrigine looked pretty good. Uh, the problem is that for acute depression, doesn't work. The evidence is compelling. Five negative studies. So you can't get as compelling as, as, as that. Imagine if you have a drug that you have five positive studies. Well, you'll always hear it. So I, I think that uh, the, uh, the, the, the global work that has been done in bipolar has been great. Um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the group that you and, and Jair lead, uh, uh, Alan, affect, mm -hmm. that's associated with affective disorders, ISBD, I think that we've we've been in examples of good global collaborative work, and uh, once more, uh, uh, Costas, Professor Morris, so thank thank you for organizing this. Uh, I think that uh, we uh, if we if we do things collaboratively, it's going to be we, we all have the, the same goal in mind. Let's help our patients wherever they are. So this is really indeed. Yeah. Mauricio, uh, let me ask you something because you were there when these decisions were made. Uh, I recently looked at the schizophrenia literature and almost all trials there are fixed dosage. And when we come to bipolar studies, the, most of them, there are a few exceptions, of course, most of them are flexible dosage. You know, what, what, what happened there? I think it's a bit of a, a, adjusting to the world as we know it. Uh, that in, in, and then since we, there's a, a different patient response, so what's going to be if you if you put a fixed dose, uh, that might be great for some patients. Actually, fixed doses are good, but different patients have different responses. And at the end of the day, what matters is to find the, the truth. Are these drugs good for patients? So that's why the flexible dosing, I think, it, I think has been a good move. I don't know uh, how it's done in other. Uh, Branches, uh, branches of medicine, but I, I, I would assume it's similar using flexible doses. Although there's a, there is a value with fixed doses, but uh, I, I, if we were more precise about um, medication, dose response in patients, that, that would be the way to go, but we're not, we're not there yet. A lot, lot of work to do we have in front of us, folks. Ostas, I think there's a couple more questions in the Q&A. Yeah. Shall I answer them? Yes, uh, the first is uh, from uh, uh, Bikram Ketri from uh, Bhutan. Uh, he has three doubts. Is there any evidence for maintenance treatment with uh, first generation antipsychotics, specifically for flufenazine decanoate uh, depot injections for BPAD patients? And the second, do antidepressants always trigger manic episode in uh, bipolar patients? What factor prevents the switch? What is the risk for a serotonin syndrome uh, while combining fluoxetine with amitriptyline? Okay, so point number one, the first generation um, antipsychotics and long-acting injection. The only study I'm aware of is a mirror image study by John Cookson, where people were um, stopped in terms of their uh, long-acting flufenazine or whatever, and then they got much worse. But and by extrapolation, one would think that these drugs were likely to prevent mania, at least. And of course, in some parts of the world, uh, there aren't, um, there isn't the ability to use things like aripiprazole long-acting or risperidone long-acting. So I think one would be justified in using them, but beware the propensity for side effects. That's point number one. The second um, point was about antidepressant switching. Well, in the McElroy study that I did with Sue McElroy, the emboldened study, the switch rate in bipolar one and two depression with paroxetine was about nine and a half percent. 
but it was just over 10% with placebo. Uh, sorry, it was 10.5% with proxetine and 9.5% with placebo. And that wasn't significantly different. So lots of switches will happen, but they're not necessarily due to the drug. Uh, we think that it's most likely to be tricyclics that uh, induce switch and also some of the very old monoamine oxidase inhibitors such as tranalcipramine, which really do cause hypomania even in people without a propensity for, uh, for bipolar. Third point is about the combination of SSRIs and amitriptyline. Um, I think serotonin syndrome is, uh, people are too, are too um, wary of this. I mean, I spent part of my PhD inducing serotonin syndrome in animals because it's a marker of receptor function. And uh, generally, I don't think it would be too much of a problem, but it's easy. It's not like uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's fairly easy to spot and you can treat it by reducing the dose. However, having said that, I don't see much point therapeutically in combining SSRIs with tricyclics, uh, and I wouldn't usually do this. So that's your three answers, Costas. I have a practice of uh, combining uh, duloxetine with uh, um, acetalopram hmm. uh, to mimic uh, clomipramine. Uh, it's practical. It has some logic but it's not evidence-based. <laughs> yeah. I think there's lots of things that people do which are uh, in the hands of the specialist, which can be quite reasonable as long as there's a pharmacological rationale. And I'm pretty sure there would be some at least case reports backing that up. However, you should go through the routine steps first before getting to that. And the last question is, what is the current status of evidence uh, of choice uh, uh, on choice of maintenance treatment based on phenomenology, mood, energy, cognition, as pointed out in the latest RNZIP guidelines? Well, we, we did this with the CIMP guidelines very Yeah, I think, very you, should, I think you should certainly take uh, cognizance of these effects, um, and especially cognition. I mean, I have a big research program in cognition and... Uh, there are some drugs, uh, possibly lorazodone, uh, possibly the antidepressant vortioxetine, and there's also Cochrane's remediation therapy that may be useful for um, ameliorating these things. So you should be aware of these domains, but most of us are going to think primarily in preventing mood and subsyndromal episodes first uh, and think about the evidence base, which is more about antimanic antidepressant and so on. But I think the Australian New Zealand guidelines and the CIMB guidelines are very uh, helpful in pointing out these additional things to be considered. If, if I can add a, uh, a comment to a previous question, Costas, the, the use of uh, uh, primary um, first generation antipsychotics as maintenance. As I mentioned before, uh, there is some evidence of, uh, in this case, uh, Haldol causing the pristogenic effects. We did. We, yeah. we saw yeah. that in a study that we did, olanzapine and Haldol. Interestingly, one of the first studies, maintenance studies done, was published by Alforce, uh, many I don't know, mid fifties or long ago, and it was uh, flupentixel, uh, and it showed good protection for mania. Uh, I think that uh, we in the field of bipolar disorder have underutilized. Uh, the long-lasting intramusculars, but again, I would stay away from the uh, from the uh, uh, first generations. But I think for the uh, atypicals, I think we got a that's something that we should think more, more about. Uh, and, and actually, Alan, in in in, um, in terms of uh, um, what is used in the UK, is um, is uh, are long-acting atypicals being used in bipolar? More certain, I will assume more. Yeah, than that, right? yeah, we, we use a lot of long acting atypicals. Um, we do use them in bipolar. Yeah, I mean, I think my question to the, the doctor in Bhutan was more framed if you only had the choice of a first generation long acting. Mm -hmm. And I think in that case, uh, you could justify using it as long as you were very careful in looking at the side effects. Could, could, couldn't agree more, actually. Let's say you only have hallows. Yeah, give it, make, but check depression. Not, rep, not necessarily a relapse, 
but subsyndromal depressant. And in that particular case, uh, I would actually add an antidepressant. Yeah, yeah. Do I have any evidence or any literature? No, but that's what I would do to my patient. Okay. This is this is what most most uh, clinical practitioners do. Of course. I mean, we I'm push, one of them. I'm, we I'm we push them. it. <laughs> sure. sure, sure. So uh, we finished with uh, questions. Uh, Professor Afzal Zaved, the president of the World uh, Psychiatric Association, is uh, with us. Would you like to say a few words? Well, thank you very much, Professor Fontelakis. Uh, what a great uh, evening, full of wisdom, full of education. And we were really privileged for having two exceptionally great speakers. And they have covered the topic, uh, focusing not only on research, but mainly on the clinical implications and the clinical use. Uh, Professor Fontelakis, credit goes to you for inviting and bringing these two uh, very excellent experts, and we hope that uh, this educational activity will go on, and we will try to make uh, uh, the difficult questions about neurotransmitters, about uh, uh, the new sciences uh, uh, into the practical nature, and uh, you have seen that uh, uh, we have uh, a participation of more than 150 people, and this really shows the interest of the people, especially when they look at the great names uh, of the speakers coming for that. And thank you, Professor Morozov. Uh, uh, Professor Fontulakis, I'm sorry, I, I joined, I have attended the whole seminar, but because of some uh, internet uh, connections, uh, I was unable to show my face, but thank you very much. And your team, especially the IT team has done an excellent job. And we look forward uh, listening to our further and the future webinars, which you have very kindly agreed to coordinate. The next, the next webinar is, I think, for May second. Yes, uh, for May second uh, on depression uh, on on unipolar depression, uh, with uh, Sigrid Casper and Michael Thais. We have we have just added a new. Uh, uh, section on our WPA's website as the future uh, uh, webinars and educational programs. And uh, we have almost been doing one or two webinars every month with different speakers, different topics, and different experts. So please keep on looking at the WPA's website for the dates of the uh, future educational webinars. Thank you for your very kind comments, Professor Javai. It's, it is certainly yeah. my honor to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to take part. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us tonight. Uh, until next time, uh, until May 2nd, take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.